Okay, so hi everybody. We've got a, a lot of um, a lot of muddiest points from the uh, the last class. So I've sort of divided these up into three categories: um, the ones that are about the way seismic waves travel through the Earth, the ones that are about the actual conclusions about the Earth's interior that are revealed by those seismic waves, and then sort of a grab bag at the end. So um, one person asks. How do we know where the cool spots and the warm spots are in Earth? And basically that comes down to um, where the seismic waves speed up uh, at a given depth. That indicates that it's cooler than normal because it's denser than normal. Denser materials transmit the seismic energy more efficiently. And where the seismic waves slow down at a given depth, that would indicate a warmer than usual spot. So more um, voluminous rock, same amount of matter distributed through a larger volume. Um, one person asked about the difference between reflection and refraction. Reflection is bouncing off of something. Refraction is going through that something but changing uh, the direction. Um, the, there were a couple of these that were really hard for me to understand. Some I just couldn't read, like the handwriting was really poor, so I'm sorry if I didn't answer your question. Um, but that's a, a, a gentle, friendly reminder that I'd like you to write neatly so I can read what it is you're saying. And then, of course, also, it's a good idea to use complete sentences. Like one person wrote, the fractures of an earthquake. Uh, and I'm not really sure what that means. But earthquakes um, occur along fractures in the crust that are called faults. Um, I don't know what else to say about that one. Um, one person asked, what do P waves and S waves do? Well, they uh, convey energy from one area to another. Um, and they convey it in different ways. So P waves are compressional waves, like shock waves, and S waves are a different kind of motion, more like a side-to-side -side motion, uh, a shearing wave. Um, let's see. How should I visualize earthquake waves? Arrows or the orbs? Are they like sound waves or light waves? Um, yeah, either, either way. Whatever works for you, whatever makes it make sense. They are capable of being visualized as sort of spheres of influence. Uh, radiating spheres, or you could visualize them as arrows that are perpendicular to that sphere's surface. Um, and so in that respect, they are exactly like sound waves and light waves. Um, can P waves refract and liquid hit the core and then reflect? Uh, if they are refracting, they're not reflecting. Um, so a given batch of P waves could hit the surface, uh, say from the mantle to the core, and a portion of that P wave will refract and a portion will reflect. Just like think about light hitting water, right? If you're out looking at a pond on a sunny day, some uh, of the pond's surface reflects light off of that surface, and in some cases the light penetrates into the pond and you can see like fish and things swimming around down below. So it can be both. Um, why does the velocity of waves increase with depth? That's because the rocks are under more pressure with depth, and so therefore they are more compact. And because they are more compact, they are more efficient at transmitting seismic energy. So the seismic waves will speed up if the material they're passing through is more efficient. And they'll slow down if that material is less efficient. Um, one person asked, what causes refraction? Um, so what causes refraction is a change in density. So if you think about, um, say, um, a glass full of water and the pencil in the glass and, and it looks crooked, that's because the water is more dense than the air. So basically where you have a difference in density and, and uh, energy waves like light waves or seismic waves are passing across that boundary from high density to low or low density to high, that causes them to change their direction. Um, why don't S waves travel through the... I can't even read this, but it looks maybe like core. What do you think? What does that say? The Oreo? Why don't S waves travel through the Oreo? S waves don't travel through the outer core because it's liquid. Um, they don't travel through the inner core because the outer core is in the way. Okay. Um, one person asks, Earth's magnetism, why does it grow one centimeter per year? I think you may have misunderstood me there. It's not Earth's magnetism that's growing one centimeter per year. In fact, a centimeter is not a, a, some, a unit that you can use to measure magnetism. It's that the inner core is growing at about a centimeter per year. Um, so ultimately, that will affect Earth's magnetism because Earth's magnetism is generated in the outer core because it flows as a liquid. Okay. Two layers of compression in the asthenosphere that create the two different minerals aside from a change in pressure, is this what makes the asthenosphere a weak solid? No. 
Um, the asthenosphere is weak because it's in addition to these phase changes where olivine turns to spinel and spinel turns to perovskite, um, there's an additional thing going on in the asthenosphere, which is that basically temperature is winning and you've got a little bit of magma there, a little bit of melt. Um, it's still mostly solid, but you do have a little bit of melt. The solid part is the part that's changing from olivine to spinel and spinel to perovskite. What might cause mantle plumes to form above the D double prime layer? Um, the mantle plumes are forming not above the D double prime layer, but from the D double prime layer. So if you've got this layer down at the bottom of the mantle that's getting heated and heated and heated from all this heat being released by the core, then that is uh, going to encourage that uh, D double prime layer material to become less and less dense until it basically takes off in the form of a plume. It's just like a lava lamp. You add heat at the bottom until you get a low enough density that it overcomes resistance and it rises to the top of the lamp. What happens to spinel and perovskite that is on the surface? How, what does it react with? Um, so spinel and perovskite are not happy at the surface of the earth because the pressure is too low. So basically they're going to react over time to form a, uh, a more stable mineral form, so like olivine. Um, the fact of the matter is, though, that this reaction, this chemical reorganization, the, the breaking of some bonds and the formation of new bonds, that actually um, takes energy to accomplish that. And that energy is lacking on the Earth's surface because it's so cold. So the pressure is trying to drive a reaction, but the lack of heat input makes that reaction hard to do. So it happens slowly, which is why you can actually hold a crystal of perovskite and it isn't going to spontaneously go wham and turn into a crystal of olivine. That being said, perovskite, olivine, and spinel are all made out of the same elements, all right, which basically means that they are ultramafic uh, in composition, and that means that they're going to be likely to react with oxygen in the atmosphere, and they're going to rust. So um, in addition to this sort of metamorphic change, there's chemical weathering of those minerals that's going on as well. What causes the color change between olivine and spinel if they are elementally the same, just at different densities? They are different minerals, okay? So there's a different crystal structure, and it's that crystal structure that determines the color as well as the hardness and all the other physical properties of minerals. So the, the same elements are there, but they're bonded to different other elements, okay? Okay, cruising along here. How do we know what material is in the mantle? Okay, so the answer to this question is twofold. One is that we uh, can figure out what its properties are by imaging it through seismic energy. So we can figure out how dense it is, for instance, based on the way that the seismic waves pass through it. But um, in terms of checking our interpretation, uh, we need to rely on uh, the little samples that are brought up by very deep-seated volcanoes. All right, so those are those things called xenoliths. So in some places, we have xenoliths of peridotite that have been brought up um, by basaltic eruptions and carried up to Earth's surface. Those xenoliths basically provide a way of sampling the mantle, which, of course, we'll never actually get to. Okay. Um, Will the inner core be much colder than the outer core? No, the inner core is warmer than the outer core. It's solid rather than liquid because of the high pressure there. So basically at certain depths in Earth's interior, temperature wins and you get melting. And in other depths, uh, the pressure wins and that keeps it in the more dense solid form. So in the inner core, pressure is dominant and the outer core temperature is dominant. But that doesn't mean that the inner core is colder than the outer core. It is in fact quite warmer. Um, indicators of the core's density. Okay, we know how dense the core is because of two things. One is the way that seismic waves travel through it, all right? And then the second way is by um, looking at the way the overall Earth uh, has a gravitational influence on other stuff in the solar system. So things like the moon, asteroids, satellites. Um, we can basically figure out what the Earth's overall um, density is because we know how big the Earth is and the gravity is a, uh, the gravitational effect is a manifestation of the density, how much mass is packed into that volume. So we can get an estimate of how much the Earth weighs, even though we can never put the Earth on a scale or something like that, based on observing its gravitational influence. Um, and then I would add to that also that if the nebular theory is correct about how the solar system formed, then we've got leftovers that are still rattling around in the solar system, asteroids, and, and when they fall to Earth, meteorites, and those basically give us a way of checking uh, the density of the core by looking at the starting materials from which the core formed. 
Okay, we've got another 10 or so of these things here. Is it possible for the waves to become unstable because of too much velocity? No. Um, one thing I still don't entirely understand is latent heat. Okay, latent heat is, is a little bit tricky and the way to really wrap your mind around it is to go at it in reverse. To get a crystal to melt, you put heat in. To get a crystal to form, you take heat out. So for instance, if you wanted to form an ice cube, which is you know, made out of crystals of ice, you put water in, in an ice cube tray and you stick it in your freezer, you take heat out of it. All right, that encourages the crystals to form. All right, if you want to get it to melt, you put heat back in and then it'll melt. All right, it's the same thing for crystals of iron in the core. All right, if you're forming a new crystal, you're releasing heat. If you're melting a crystal, you're putting heat in. It's as simple as that. The bonds that are, are there in the crystal basically are uh, formed when heat is released. If you want to break those bonds, you've got to put heat energy in to get the bonds to break. That's latent heat in a nutshell. Okay, um, one more on the core's heat. Uh, if the inner core is crystallizing, it would be, be getting cooler. Uh, this is true. It is releasing heat, and that is the heat that drives plate tectonics. Okay, That's where that heat is coming from. So by core's heat, is it less specific to the inner core, or is it in the early phase of its cooling? By core's heat, is it less? I don't understand what that person is asking. No, it's not in the early phase of its cooling. It's been cooling for a long time. That's why we've got an inner core. Okay, it's growing over time. As it releases heat, that encourages convection in the outer core. That convection brings heat from the bottom of the outer core to the top. That heat is then transferred to the overlying mantle. The mantle then warms up at the bottom. It convects. It brings the warm material to the surface. And that heat is released as heat flow through the crust. And of course, also released at volcanoes, where a lot of heat is brought to the surface all at once. OK. Um, does the temperature always stay the same at depth? No, it does not. In some places, it's warmer at a given depth because there's material rising. In some places, it's cooler at a given depth because there's material sinking. Um, is there partial melting in the outer core, or is it completely liquid? As far as we can tell, it's probably mostly liquid. Um, there's probably some solid material in there, but uh, the, uh, the, the way that the S waves completely disappear when they hit the outer core suggests that it's dominated by liquid. One thing I still don't entirely understand is the crust mantle boundary, shallow versus deep wave speeds. Okay, think about this in terms of continental crust sitting on top of mantle. The continental crust is made out of granite, 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter average density. That's sitting on top of peridotite in the mantle, 3.3 grams per cubic centimeter average density. The peridotite is denser, so seismic waves are going to travel through it faster. There's a pretty crisp break. Uh, at least in most places, um, at the bottom of the mantle. In other words, the moho is a discrete boundary where suddenly you go from continental crust above to mantle below. And so we see this sudden jump in wave speeds because there's a sudden jump in density. According to the nebula theory, will the planets we see today continue to try and stick together and grow bigger and bigger? Great question. Um, the answer to this is no, because essentially um, each planet's position is at this point pretty stable. Um, remember that our solar system is four and a half billion years old, so we've had a lot of time to sort out the details. And uh, the stuff that we still see 4.5 billion years later, like the Earth and the Moon and Mercury and Saturn, these are all basically the survivors. Um, so uh, each planet's position is essentially a function of two things. This outward directed force, like if you swung a bucket over your head and swung it around and around and around, the water in that bucket isn't going to spill out because it's basically this outward directed force. Um, and that's true in the solar system as well. There's this outward directed force that's essentially spinning the planets towards the outer part of the solar system. But at the same time, there's an inward directed force, which is the gravitational attraction of the sun. The sun has 99% of the mass in the solar system. So it's got a huge amount of gravitational attraction that it's pulling on the planets with. So each planet's position is sort of a, a compromise between this outward directed force and the inward directed force. And if um, suddenly the sun were to wink out of existence, that gravity would be gone and the planets would go shooting out into uh, space, basically following the trajectory that they're orbiting in. Um, so no, they're not going to crash into one another because each one is stable in its uh, given position. Okay, um, final two have to do with uh, the shadow zone. Why can't P waves be refracted into the P wave shadow zone? 
And uh, the one person just asked about the two different shadow zones. So basically the shadow zone is a function of refraction. So if the core were not there, we would not have a shadow zone. But because we do have a core there, and because it's a different density than the mantle, as P waves hit it, they end up refracting. And so they get basically steered away from certain areas and steered toward other areas. And so um, basically from the earthquake around the planet to 105 degrees away from the earthquake, that's just sort of regular travel through the mantle. And then you've got that zone, whoops, from 105 to 140, um, where um, basically you don't see any P waves there because they're being refracted. And, uh, and then they, they're all concentrated on the opposite side of the planet because whichever P waves go through the core basically get funneled into that zone between 140 degrees and 140 degrees on the other side. So uh, the, the shadow zone is entirely a function of refraction. And um, as far as the S-wave shadow zone is concerned, it's basically because the S-waves hit the core and get absorbed uh, in terms of their energy. So there's no way to shear a liquid. They don't show up at all on the other side of the planet. Hey, that's it. We, uh, we made it through. Uh, that was a lot of muddiest points. So clearly you guys were thinking deeply uh, in that lecture. I'm proud of you for these great questions. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you in class uh, later today. Bye.